Hi. Hi, everyone, and welcome to uh, the Winter Warmer. Uh, this at six o'clock, Winter Warmer Fest. It's great to have people listening. We have three fantastic poets with us from uh, literally from all over the world, I might say. And um, tonight, um, I'll be in, we have Jane Clark from Ireland. We have um, Ranjit Haskote from Bombay. And we have Mary Jean Chan, who's uh, based in London, but from Hong Kong. So uh, I'll, I'll introduce each of them in turn. Uh, we'll start with Jane. Uh, they're very welcome, and it's great to have you here. We, just, we were just chatting beforehand there. And um, so I'll introduce Jane, and Jane will give her her, her reading first. Uh, so just to give you a, a, a bit of information about Jane, Jane is the author of two poetry collections at the moment, um, The River and Wind of Tree Falls, both from Blood Axe. Um, and they're very recent, really, 2015 and 2019. Uh, both have been very successful. Um, the first collection, The River, was shortlisted for the Royal Society of Literatures on, on that uh, prize. And the second one was shortlisted for um, the Piggott Prize, Poetry Prize in Ireland, the Irish Times Poetry Now Award, and the uh, Farmgate Cafe National Poetry Award, um, and one of her poems, Copper Souls. Uh, from when the tree falls and um, was highly commended in the forward book of poetry in 2021 so she's um she's doing very well and um, um, she also won the hennessy award for Liter literary award in 2016 uh, for emerging poetry and the inaugural list was just a couple of years ago i think uh, jane wasn't it um yeah. she's originally from a uh, farm, farm in county roscommon um but she's living in county wicklow but uh, as you can see there, she's actually reading from us common tonight, I think. She's a beautiful uh, Irish um, uh, delf behind her there. So it's a beautiful setting. So please, Jane, uh, start off. Okay. Thanks very much, Colm. And uh, thanks to everybody, Paul and his team, uh, for inviting me to read at the Oveil Winter Warmer. And, and I'm thrilled to read with Ranjit and Mary Jean and looking forward to their work very much. Uh, I am going to start with some winter poems. And the first one I wrote to remind myself that despite the darkness, or maybe because of the darkness, winter can be a very creative time. When winter comes, remember what the blacksmith knows. Dim light is best at the furnace to see the colours go from red to orange to yellow. The forging heat that tells the steel is ready to be held in the mouth of the tongs and it's time to lengthen and narrow with the ring of the hammer on the horn of an anvil to bend until the forgiving metal has found its form then file the burrs remove sharp edges smooth the surface polish with a grinding stone and see it shine like gold. So um, the next uh, poem I actually chose to read this evening because the dresser behind me features in the poem. And uh, I'm in my mother's kitchen in Roscommon because I'm with her for the weekend. Uh, so um, White Fields. Stopping by his jacket on a hook at the end of the dresser, she breathes him in. Cigarettes, silage and brill cream. She touches rough tweed, worn collar and cuffs, pocketed coins, hay seeds and the cold steel of his bone-handled penknife. She recalls mornings in fields white with hoarfrost when the heat between them would thaw the frozen pond. He'd cut dark twine, shake out bales in slivers of warmth for breathing clouds of Frisians, circled round, waiting. When the children came, he stayed longer outside, always a lamb or a calf to mind, a fallen wall that needed him. Um, 
the mention of the fallen wall brings me to my next poem and it's um, called Dry Stone Wall but I wrote it with the help of my parents giving me the vocabulary for this poem that I wanted to write and so they were sitting at the kitchen table where I'm sitting now and gave me all these words which I tied together into a poem and I actually read this poem at my father's funeral and two of my cousins who are a uh, great dry stone wallers themselves came up and said they'd be perfect directions for uh, building a wall so that was the highest compliment i could get dry stone wall i'll skim the scraw dig a trench wide and deep to hold the given stone lay silver gray against green rocks with square planes to build off Slivers, thin as slate to level in between. I lift the stones, test where they'll nestle into what's already there. Fill the middle with spalls, keep the edge stones from falling in. I use old stones, dappled with lichen and moss. Leave gaps to let the wind blow through, nooks for pennyworth and hearthstone to grow. I'll cover the joins, mine the batter, stack each course till it takes its place between two fields. Keep a few of the finest for the finish, long and flat capstones to span the width. It'll be the kind of wall cattle will stand by, stretching their necks for a scratch on a high stone. Um, so those two, those poems, those last two poems were from my first collection, The River, and now I'm going to read one from um, my second collection, uh, When the Tree Falls. And I just thought it, it being winter and everything, we need a bit of colour. So that's why I chose this one. The Yellow Jumper. They weren't married long when she saw it. A turtleneck jumper in Murray's window, yellow as happiness, as the flash on a goldfinch's wings. She imagined him wearing it at the fairs, standing out from all the rest in their greens and greys. Eighteen shillings and sixpence. She paid for it on tick, threepence a week. For all that he smiled on his birthday, it remained on the back of the bedroom chair. One day, she folded and packed it in the chest with the spare candles, letters, photographs and the other questions she didn't ask. She likes to think of him there among pens of breeding heifers, weanlings and hoggets splendid in yellow. Um, yes, it, again, uh, that, that collection, When the Tree Falls, there are two presiding presences in it. Uh, one is my dear friend Shirley McClure, a poet who died in 2016 in September, and then my father who died in 2017 in January. So there wasn't long between them, and their strong presence in my life is reflected in the book. Um, so I wanted to read a poem for each of them. So this one is Copper Souls in memory of Shirley McClure, 1962 to 2016. In an old Finnish story, the hero must build a boat from oak to bear him home through a raging storm. But he cannot complete his work without three magic words. The first will secure the stern. The second will fasten the ledges. The third will ready the forecastle. To find the words, he must walk across points of needles, edges of hatchets, blades of swords, for which he needs shoes with copper soles. Dear friends, while the doctor Chase pain around your body. 
Where will we find such a cobbler? And um, two poems from the collection uh, that come from the time when we were nursing my father in this house, uh, the house where he had lived in since he was born. And uh, so two poems from the last two months of his life. I've got you. Through days of morphine and titbits to tempt his appetite, there's nowhere else to be. I hold his teacup to his lips, wash his face and the hands I rarely touched. During the night, old hurts and worries surface like stones in a well-tilled field. What time is it now, he asks on the hour. He sings to himself and murmurs lines he learned as a child. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way. When he asks to get up, I hold his wrists, brace my weight against his. For a moment, he's confused. It's okay, Janie, I've got you. Go on now, you can stand. And a uh, second poem from that time. Uh, <clears throat> this poem's called Blue Cards. Anybody here who's listening, who's from a uh, rural Irish uh, childhood will know what the blue cards are, but I doubt that Ranjit and Mary Jean do, so I'll have to explain it for them. They're like passports that you have for cows and cattle uh, for buying and selling on a farm, and they're absolutely necessary, and they often took pride of place on the kitchen table. Blue cards. Winter mornings, he was gone before dawn to fairs in Ballyhonas, Clare Morris, Ballin Robe. He came home with muck on his coat, smelling of shorthorns and Herefords. Sometimes he told us who he'd met, the blind man who knew each of his cows by their lowing, the widow who bargained harder than any dealer. But mostly, he sat distracted by prices, cigarette smoke spiralling to the kitchen ceiling, blue cards spread around the table. Today, when everyone else was away, I wrapped him warm, pushed his wheelchair through the haggard, up the yard to the sheds. The cattle lifted doleful eyes from heaps of silage. Hello, lads, he said. Okay, I'm just looking at my time there. Um, I'm going to read a poem, uh, which is go uh, some new poems. I wanted to read some new poems. And uh, this poem is going to be in the next edition of Poetry Ireland Review. And it was inspired by the day my partner and I, who's now my wife, went to register for our civil partnership. And we were actually the first couple in County Wicklow where we live and so the registrar was a bit uh, it was all new to her her first we wait on grey plastic chairs with the other births deaths and marriages the sun tries to shine through narrow frosted windows close to lunchtime the registrar ushers us into her office Stacks of files on every surface look set to topple. She murmurs, you're my first, and reads out the regulations, as if translating a foreign script, then shuffles through papers, studies the stapler on her desk, and reads them again. When we tell her we've been together 20 years, she stops searching for a biro meets our eyes and smiles. It'll be a beautiful day. And uh, for that day, I 
uh, eventually wrote, wrote vows for that day. And uh, so I'll read the vows that I wrote for that day, which, as I you know, often say, it is different when you're writing vows when you've already been together uh, almost 20 years. Vows. I can't promise it's chiseled from gold and spirals that speak of forever. I can't tell you it's wise as a mountain with pines that reach for heaven. I can't promise it's flawless as honey gathered by bees in bell heather. I can't say it's simple as silk spun from cocoon into treasure. But I promise it's rooted as rowan with berries that sing to September. I promise it's to and it's fro with surprise like Glen Malore weather. A seasoned rowboat, moored and unmoored at your pleasure. Um, so another uh, a new poem, uh, this one is actually in a new anthology brought out by the Munster Literature Centre and Pat Cotter, who uh, is there in Cork with all the people organising this tonight. Pat's uh, very, very busy in the Munster Literature Centre um, and he, uh, he was organising the Cork Spring Festi Poetry Festival and he had to cancel it at very short notice in March because of the pandemic. And he invited the poets who were due to be there, which who included myself, to submit a poem for this anthology, Poems from Pandemia. And um, it's just come out and there's lots of wonderful poems in it. But uh, one of them, I have a poem in it, which I wrote during the first lockdown when I wasn't able to travel to be with my mother and she was unwell and it came from that. Flowers from the hills for Dora. Because I can't travel the miles between us, I'll send you flowers from the hills. Ladies' bed straw to brighten your bedroom. Placed by your pillow, it'll scent your sleep. Scarlet pimpernel to dispel your sadness. It wakes early as the blackbird sings. Crane's bill, Herb Robert, Ragged Robin, come pink as dawn to your window. Eyebright will heal your tired sight. Two-lipped petals, lilac-lined. Teasel to fill, feed goldfinch in your garden. Orange tips will drink from the leaves. Marsh marigold to ward off all harm. Stitchwort sprinkled like stars at your feet. And uh, I'll come to my last poem uh, this evening. Um, during the summer in July, uh, RTE contacted me and invited me to write a poem for a concert they were having at the end of August. And the brief they gave me was to write something quite short that would in some way respond to what we've been through with COVID as a country and also in some way uh, look at what we may be facing into in the autumn. So I was a bit stumped by that and worried I wouldn't be able to do it. But I went walking along the coast of Wicklow and there's a colony, um, which is a fenced off area on the Shingle Beach, which Birdwatch Ireland look after to protect little turn birds who to protect their nests because they nest in shingle. And it was those birds, those nests that a wonderful place protected by Birdwatch Ireland that led to this poem. So it's my last poem. So I wanted to say thank you again to everybody involved in organising the Winter Warmer Festival, uh, particularly Paul Casey, who does amazing work. And um, I'm really looking forward to hearing Ranji and Mary Jean's poems. And thank you to the audience, whoever is listening out there. Thank you very much for tuning in to us. Little Turn Colony, Kilcool. In shallow nests among pebbles, most of the eggs survived the high tides. 
August slips into September. The fledglings, light as whelk shells, get ready to fly. The sun and stars will guide them, and though they'll be hungry, thirsty, cold, the Earth's magnetic field will pulse in their hearts like hope. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jane. That was uh, fantastic. Really, they were very moving poems, as um, Mary Jean uh, and um, Ranjit were both mentioning there in the chat. Um, I, I think people listening really enjoyed them. I, I was um, touched by the uh, the one about the stone wall. Uh, I, I built a dry stone wall in my own garden out here, out the back here, years ago, about twenty years ago. But it's, uh, it, it it didn't last, unfortunately. But uh, thanks for that. Um, that was fantastic. Thanks, um, no, we'll uh, we, we'll go to Ranjit next, and then um, I hope I I, I hope Ranjit. I, I think he's refreshing his screen, and I'll just give you um, Ranjit's uh, resume. He's got a fantastic resume, and um, he's a poet, translator, cultural theorist, and curator based in Bombay. He's had seven collections of poetry, including. Joan Whale from Penguin, uh, mostly from Penguin books, and his most recent is The Atlas of Lost Beliefs from Ark. Um, Ark are our, our um, festival partners here. Um, they, uh, Angela and Tony uh, have been supporting the festival, the Winter Warmer Festival, for, for a good few years. Um, he, Ranjit has also curated India's first ever national pavilion at the Venice Biennale in 2011. Um, he's been a writer in residence in Munich and in Berlin, um, and his poems have been translated into German, Hindi, Bangla, Marathi, Irish, Swedish, Spanish, and Arabic. Uh, so he's um, and and he's you know he's been involved in writing and publishing many books. Uh, so hopefully you now um, he, he he's he's back with us, and we'll, we'll hand over to Ranjit. Thank you so much, Colin. And it's really marvelous to be here at the Winter Warmer Festival. I do wish that I could have been there physically. Uh, I'd have loved to be uh, in Cork, in Ireland, because uh, this may come as news to many people in Ireland, but uh, your history and ours have been intertwined. And uh, the events of Easter 1916 were very, very crucial to our own anti-colonial struggle here in, in India. So there's a very strong sense of, uh, of uh, affinity. And I'm really, really happy to be reading today with Jane and with uh, Mary Jean. Jane, I do want to say how deeply moved I was by your poems, by the, by the marvelous articulation of human relationships by uh, the presence of place that you invoke and the sheer thingness, the artisanal thingness of metal and stone and the elements. So I thought what I might do is uh, really to begin my set uh, by responding to some of the concerns in your last poem. Uh, what are we doing on and with this planet? What are we doing to nature, which we reduce to natural resources? Uh, how have we brought ourselves to the strange point of extinction? Uh, it's a poem that uh, is rather grandly called Natural History, but uh, it compresses some of these questions. Natural History, and it goes like this. A history of mammoths salted away in warehouses, scrawled in chalk. Sleep is a secret you once overheard. A history of rivers snaking down steep slopes, walled in glass. Clay is a wisdom that leaves no fingerprints. A history of ballads that dolphins sang about horizons broken by microphones. Shale is the darkness you struggle to weigh. A history of drought. Gulls circling above gaunt hills waiting for rain to wash the words away. Words are rapids that drown us all. 
I'm reading from from the book that uh, that Colm uh, mentioned, which is uh, the Atlas of Lost Beliefs that Ark have just published earlier this year. And I'm going to open with a set of poems that are prayers in some sense. They're prayers, they're anti-prayers, they reach out to some larger framework of belonging that I think uh, we look for, we rarely find. And in these months of pandemic and lockdown, I think we've been struggling with these questions. This one's called Highway Prayer. If you're writing a fresh anthem for the one scorched island marooned in cyclone country, be sure to put in a line about burnt tires and sleeping dogs, and another line on the flags, curtains, TV screens, more flags, all the shrouds the islanders are hanging up to protect themselves from the world. They need a savior. That'll be the man in the red raincoat falling through an open door. An unseen hand stops him, props him up. He blocks the door, a crucifix barring the passage of time. Time burns right through him. He clutches at his burst stomach, crouching on the sidewalk, holding fast to the creased memory of a river he once loved. In him, the shimmer is great, greater than panic, greater than the fear of flies, of stakes, of exploding shells, of ending up as roadkill. Tongue-tied, he reads this rosetta of violence, this highway across which sirens call to knotted prophets, batmen to jokers, jets to sharks, Bless me, ivories, the land pirate says, at last shiver me timbers. In this place that found me empty, in this place that found me parched, I am blood, I am grief, I am the returning rocket, I am contrary to the Commonwealth, lord of the booming antlers on a yellow signboard. Let go, he calls out, let go. Craft me into this totality that never closes. And I'm going to move from there to a poem that has to do with, with the word, with the tongue, with going back to where poetry comes from in the first place. And the poem's called Glossa. And it goes like this. The source is in the pause. The source is in the spring. The split wishbone twangs in your throat. The hunter's arrow shatters your heel. The avalanche wind whips the harp of shocked trees. The startled caribou pulse in waves through river and mist. The rain has drenched you, no skin to hold the body in. You've found your tongue. And I've often thought as a poet who also writes on art and curates art about the distance between the, the visual image and the kinds of images that we conjure up, that we create in words. And sometimes, uh, as in a poem like Miniature Painting, which I'm about to read, I try and imagine what it might be like for a poem to aspire to some of the things that get done in certain kinds of uh, miniature paintings from the 15th, 16th, and 17th centuries. Uh, how people come together in these paintings, how tense collapses so that past, present, and future run together, and how different sorts of events are brought into a larger unity, miniature painting. And it is, as I said, a certain kind of prayer. The worshiper as lost cloud, as woodpecker, as five crested tree, as turmeric plume in the night sky, the god as spray of rose petals, as parrot wings sparking against rock, as the sea's voice at first light, the worshipper 
as leaf serrated by the shears of love, the god as spear point piercing the rain clouds, the god as half moon and starburst, as hermit lying on a deer skin at the river's edge, the god as pomegranate tree, the worshipper as its bending shadow, the worshipper as kneeling saint, the worshipper as runaway bride, the worshipper, the god, as any one thing of a thousand that we are, were, might have been, or be. From one to the other, the eye darts, a one-legged man struggling for balance. As I often say when I'm on the air like this, I sometimes wonder if I'm like that Soviet cosmonaut who was stranded on a space station for about a year or so before people realized he was even there. So um, I just hope there actually are people out there listening and uh, all my friends around this virtual table, a message would reassure me greatly. And I'm going to, oh, thank you so much, Mary Jane. <laughs> this, is, this is lovely. Uh, I'm going to move now to a set of poems that have to do with cities, cities that I've loved, cities that, uh, uh, that mean something to me out of the deep histories that they bear. Uh, this poem is set in Venice, and it's called Printer. I have to say that even in this incredibly digital, increasingly digital age, I love the feel of printed paper, printer's ink, the smell of vanilla that emerges out of these books that we read and write. And uh, I like to think back to Venice, which was such a great center of printing. And this poem is dedicated to Francesco Grifo, who invented italics, and who was a rather colorful sort of chap. So, printer. Follow his shaking, roasted hand. He sets chisel against wooden edge, points burin at plate strikes lead against wedge, lays kern against grain. And so through the night rams out the ringing cavalcade of words. The ink rains down in neat lines and orchards planted on the sheet. Psalms, verses, prayers grow. He prunes them all with wayward grace. The page burns bright. The typesetter's eyes grow rimmed with red from staring at tight, infinitely small and mocking margins. His rained lust explodes in hot metal, then fine brocade. Most mornings he ends up drunk in a canal, bruised from a brawl. One day he will swing from a hangman's rope, singing to the last, yes, in three languages, yes, I announce, I declare, I proclaim it. I was manic enough last night to smash through all the typefaces, to drug every font. And now in my own sharply cut sans serif, I've slugged this by dimming candlelight for today's edition. This crazed compositor's invocation to a dawn that will break over Venice without his help. Where I'm going, there's blazing horror and no gentle restoration. Pitch the only ink, flame, the only imprint, and icy darkness, my lord, high censor. Find harbors, all your galleys that sail out of my mind's bedeviled press. <clears throat> I'm moving now to another city, another well-loved city, New York, and a photographer who really memorialized that city. Diane Arbus. So this is really uh, <clears throat> for Diane Arbus. It's called Aperture. And it uh, <clears throat> came about after we went to a really beautiful retrospective of her work, showing some of the very, very early work, the way in which she went around the city, looking in at small events, uh, the personae of the street, and how strange moments of transcendence really leap out of these, these uh, little moments. So here goes Aperture for Diane Arbus. What would the knife grinder want with a broken spoon and a pair of melons? 
a Japanese bowl spangled with an iron glaze and three dried lilies. He's waiting for the little boy and girl standing hand in hand to cross the chalk line between curb and street and go off like rockets while the barber stares mouth open through his clean glass door razor in hand a customer strapped in his chair the ibis headed god in the art deco panel above the knife grinder's door is candid when it's time he says double checking the man's heartbeat you gotta use the snake And this takes me now, as you see, I'm sliding from one city to another, and I'm coming back to my own city, actually, uh, <clears throat> Bombay, where for one reason or another, for a number of years, it's almost a kind of archetypal situation. You find yourself waiting in a restaurant or a cafe for someone to show up, and uh, a window opens, a poem arrives, and it simply embraces whatever is happening around you at that point. So this is pretty much what happened here. It's called Open for Business. And there's a line in it of, uh, from a Konkani song uh, written in the 19th century by a uh, Goan uh, uh, poet and songwriter. Uh, it refers to uh, a famous moment in Goan history when Goa was divided between the Portuguese-ruled part and the Indian-ruled part, and what it meant to cross the river. Uh, for those who pick up on the line, there's an entire history of what it means for a country to be divided, for a place to be divided by language, by religion, and yet that uh, you can form bridges in that situation. I know that situation will resonate with many of you here. Uh, and there's a way in which the poem picks up on that moment and then moves back to the everyday. <clears throat> Open for business. Newspaper bunched in hand, you're misting the door with Lysol wiping the glass panel in wide arcs. But the man in the blue paisley bandana, who's whistling the opening bars of isn't planning to get scrubbed off the menu. He's pushing through with a crate of eggs, his hands itching for whisk and skillet, the first Spanish omelet of the day. He's a dancer, sweet-talking the boatman, into getting her across the river. You're a tightrope walker with a limp nursing a sore throat. You spray the swinging air with soap. Still in the mode of the city, I'm now going to revisit uh, a well-beloved street from childhood. It really is, um, it's very much the neighborhood where I grew up in Bombay, uh, here in Carr, South Avenue. And uh, it's a way of thinking through and feeling through the changes that have come upon what used to be a garden suburb and has now got caught up in this large drama of uh, what happens when a metropolis really exceeds all bounds, real estate takes over, and your childhood memories really vanish under um, skyscrapers. So this is called the bungalows of South Avenue. I'd followed a bus that called itself destiny in large white capitals across its back windows down a burning road in April. We passed a scrim, its lush Palm Beach sunset trapped in a haze shimmering above the asphalt, then rolled to a stop where workers had squatted for a quick lunch. A ladder leaned against the side of a house I'd known as a child. Cool mint verandas, lace blinds, iced tea. Now I ran my hand along a buff wall rose bushes had once hidden and looked up through the ladder's rungs at a lump of coal flaring in a blue-gray spoon bent over with the rough heat it held. Sun in my eye, the roof a milk cloud that had stopped in its tracks. This house that had found me again, I thought could do 
with more than the sizzle of a welder's torch stitching up an iron seam, the lick of a painter's brush jabbing and nuzzling at cracks in the plaster, more than cement seals to patch cracked bricks behind the hibiscus. Might the spiral staircase with its gnarled garlands of Art Deco leaves rusty peeling off have been trying to speak to the men in their dusty overalls, its cadences, white noise lost below the gushing pump, the whine of saws, the pounding of drills, logos before topos, the word pushes its abstract self before whatever the eye can open. What words could magic this place back to me? Might the beat of a deep buried mineral heart have faltered through flutes that no one could hear above the squirrels chittering in the gulmohar, the anvil fever of hammers, and my own ears stopped up against sirens, but also the twanged salutes of cotton carders the descants of street acrobats. Had I heard nothing at all? Had I missed a step or a fall? And I'll close with a poem called The Swimming Pool. I used to be a swimmer and it's been many, many years since I last swam and I strongly feel that I'm missing some essential dimension of who I am when I'm not in the water. But I do a lot of my writing now on, well, not a lot, but a considerable amount of it. Um, sitting beside a pool where, as a child, I used to swim. So it's a strange sense of uh, being in close proximity, but cut away from something that meant so much to you at one point. Here comes the swimming pool. You're dripping away shedding water and scales as you climb out of the pool, giddy gills wilting into lungs, searing balloons of trapped oxygen. The light and lyrical self is burning up on re-entry. Purged, it stumbles from a wet pelt sloughed off on the floor. Shavings of sky sawn by the wind drop on the water. You flick away the light of unreported moons, never disturb dust, attachments, or silences. The handprint you left on the wall when you came out of the pool is drying in the noon heat. You're a thumb and a digit away from extinction. Noon shards, a gray man's hacking at a block of ice with a sickle. Leaves shimmer on the water that flinches like the skin of a sleeping dog when he trawls the tree fall with a frayed net. Your body is a gathering intensity of shadows broken by a surge of glass. Regent of vacancy, gather up the folded bathrobe from the abandoned chair, settle under the deck umbrella whose shadow has migrated across the pool. He gives in by degrees to the slurp and sluice. Little deaths claim his time. Now another he enters his mind, tissues, cells. That he is plunging through the upside down sky to catch the diver's farewell, the lost pearl. Centaur, foundling, surviving twin, they wrote me on the Britlist pages of the songbook. I'm wearing this season for the last time. For the last time, this green shawl, these leaves twisted to form a diadem. Next year, he will return as fire, gulls floating above his head. His image will trail behind him in a canal of shouts and whispers. Thank you, he will say to the lifeguard. That is not my skull you have there in the raven's mask. Thank you so much for your attention. I want to thank all of you around this table, Jane, Mary Jean, Colm, Paul, everybody from the festival, and all of you out there who've tuned in and who are listening to us. 
Thank you so very much. It's been lovely to be here. Thank you for that, Ranja. That, that was a beautiful reading. Um, you uh, brought us to a lot of interesting places there. And your, your knowledge of the world and world history and uh, geography was very evident. Um, we'll have to get you to Cork and to get you to write some poetry about Cork, I think, a poem about Cork, um, because uh, we feel this is a great city here as well, just like Venice and Bombay and um, New York. So, um, <laughs> Um, next, we'll, that was fantastic. Now, on to our last reader, um, Mary Jean Chan. Um, Mary, is, uh, Mary Jean is based in London. She's from Hong Kong. She's a, a London-based poet, lecturer, and editor. Um, her debut poetry collection, Flesh, from Faber and Faber, is the winner of the 2019 Costa Book Award for Poetry. Uh, she, she has twice been... Uh, shortlisted for the forward prize for the best single poem and is the recipient of a 2019 Eric Gregory Award and the 2018 Poetry Society Jeffrey Dahmer Prize. In spring 2020, uh, Mary Jean served as guest co-editor uh, at the Poetry Review. Uh, she currently lectures in creative writing at Oxford Brooks University, so um, she's in, in a very short time, she's after achieving an awful lot and uh, really looking forward now, uh, Mary Jean, to your reading. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, this has been such a lovely evening. I've really enjoyed listening to Jane and to Ranjit. Um, wonderful evocations of place and of cities. Uh, some of them I've visited myself. So uh, a real pleasure to be sharing the virtual stage with you all tonight. Thank you so much uh, again for uh, having me here. Uh, so tonight I'll just read from Flesh and uh, I'll start sort of chronologically and begin with a, a coming of age poem. Um, the title of my collection is Flesh, which is the French word for arrow, but in my usage I use it to denote a fencing technique. So it's, it's actually an aggressive fencing move where you run at your opponent at a high speed and it's quite flamboyant and you don't use it often. And so I was quite enamored with this word um, because also of its pun with the English word, the flesh of the body. And I wanted to convey the sense of the fencer's defensiveness in some sense, um, wanting to be armored and um, safe in the world, but also the vulnerability of the flesh underneath, how we also at the same time want to be open and vulnerable and to share our um, truest selves with everyone. So that was something I was thinking of when I um, wrote this collection. And I'll start with a fencing poem. Practice. As a teenager, fencing was the closest thing I knew to desire. All the girls swapping one uniform for another before practice, their white dresses replaced by britches. I thought we were princes in a fairy tale with a twist, since there were no princesses to be taken, wed, as knights, we were told to aim for an imaginary spot, just above our opponent's left breast. Often, I left a bruise, the blade's tip ricocheting off chest guards onto skin. Just as often, I would feel yellow blooms of ache where the girl I thought was beautiful had pierced my heart. Hours later, I would transform. I would head back home with a deepening sense of dread, my bruises fading to quiet. So I'm originally from Hong Kong and I've been living in London for six years now and I've been abroad for more than a decade. Um, so it's sometimes difficult for me to think about, you know, what it would have been like had I not left home uh, and one reason I left, and it's a sad reason, I suppose, is that as a queer person, I, at the time, didn't feel that it was possible to develop a life there. And I'm sure a lot of queer people know the sense of feeling exiled from the place they love most, partly because of who they are. And um, I found myself writing this next poem that I'll read to you after having read the work of Adrian Rich, who is a wonderful poet in the US, and um, she is the reason I am a poet today. And I wanted to write this poem in her memory. And so I've also used a title of her collection as my uh, title of my poem. A wild patience 
has taken me this far. I am writing in the voice of my most hopeful self. Amnesia was my daily bread. Thank God for fan fiction, for it gets better, for poets audacious enough to mention the body. Do you know what camouflage looks like on a day-to-day -day basis? Checking the coast is clear before opening a single tab and multiple decoys on a screen. Surreptitiously reading Shakespeare, the scene where Cesario woos Olivia. Watching my parents' faces for a sign to hold a tidal wave back. A daily prayer for the strength to confess nothing at all times. One day, it becomes a choice to walk out of this life or to begin living mine. I left half of my language behind to escape my impeccable persona. How I wanted to perform a heroic act to gain acceptance into the kingdom of ordinary people. To love a city and to not have it love you back is its own form of torture. When I met a beautiful stranger for the first time, I was deeply afraid of her tenderness. An appointment with a therapist led to a second date. I was given permission, needed permission. She held my hand till I began to comprehend the territory of skin, its frantic heart and silent ponds. Most nights I dream of my mother's face by turns harsh and tender. In a nightmare I shouted at her, neither you nor I are the enemy. What do mothers ask their own daughters everywhere in the world? Is there a question? Ask me something. This next poem is a slightly happier poem, I suppose. Um, it describes a domestic scene that I once only imagined were possible, and now it indeed is possible for me. They would have all that. To sing the evening home, she prepares a pot of lentil stew her phone radiant with messages, imagining her lover's steady hand gripping her own phone to navigate towards some notion of home, their flat a familiar place of worship, their bodies growing apart and moving together with the regularity of heartbeat, hot breath. There the lover is, running to catch a bus, wondering at her lover's motions throughout the flat, how her feet must press on the floor with each step, how the orchid must have stretched itself a few millimeters overnight, how the stew must be whispering on the stove and the table laid for dinner. They are gentler because they have memorized each other's fears like daily prayer, how too much salt brings back the years of loneliness, how a bath may be more necessary than a rough kiss after a day's drought of tenderness. They are gentler because they have grown too knowledgeable to love any other way. How have I hurt you? Such asking becomes routine, almost like walking down the aisle of a supermarket at evening, but it is what they do best. Beyond desire, two clasped bodies holding the heart's ache at bay. This next poem um, was born out of my um, sort of reflection on how I grew up in the sense that I grew up in a uh, Cantonese speaking household and I spoke English at school because that was uh, a time when Hong Kong had just been handed back over to China, but English was still the dominant language. Indeed, it still is in some quarters in Hong Kong nowadays, despite us being a post-colonial city. And I was reflecting on how, um, despite I write mother in this book, um, indeed, the word mother in English appears over a hundred times in my debut collection. I've never actually said the word mother to my own mother because I speak to her in, in Chinese, in Cantonese and in Mandarin. So this next poem reflects on that. This grammatical offer of uniqueness is untrue. I have never said mother my entire life. 
She speaks Shanghainese and Mandarin and Cantonese, knows select phrases in French or English, words like sophisticated, multisyllabic. She would pluck them like sudden notes from a warbler's throat, her magic sleigh of hand at a dinner party where one of the guests is an elderly white man, professorial. When I say mother, I mean all those mothers I have witnessed or envisioned, mothers of history and mothers of our present historical moment, all desperately trying to love their children, even those the laws have deemed as unworthy as washcloths, tumble dried for the last time, dirt ridden, beyond help. So continuing on the theme of uh, cleanliness, I suppose, um, I have a poem in here about washing one's hands. And I, I didn't realize until many years later, indeed until a few years ago, that this was a SARS poem. Um, growing up in Hong Kong, I was 13 when the SARS epidemic hit. And it was a very tumultuous nine months. And my father's a doctor. So I think that uh, left a very sort of severe impression on me. And uh, this poem is perhaps about that as much as it is about our current predicament. Safe space. Wash your hands, rub soap into foam into lost hands. Focus on the running tap, the way your hands momentarily disappear and you feel safe again. The bathroom is a place you can always rely on in whatever country containing a door you are allowed to lock. Lock the door, even though the flat is empty and there are no mouths, no doors that let the wild things through. Wild love, wild beauty, wild hurt, wild fear, all those beasts and your inner voice whispering, these are the options, fight, flight or freeze. This next poem um, was inspired by a phrase taken from an interview with the wonderful um, Asian American poet Ocean Vong, where he described uh, being queer as a nurturing of vigilance. And I've always loved that. I, I love the idea of how queer children learn to observe the world and to observe people's expressions from a young age, because that is how you stay safe and that's how you keep yourself um, you know, sort of on the right side of everyone. And so I wrote this poem inspired by that uh, quote from Ocean Vong. Vigilance. I learned to withhold my body the way a dog lifts its sore paw in midair, touching nothing, a life lived tenuously. My habitual position is to remain very still at all times. Being queer was ultimately a nurturing of vigilance, tiptoeing around words as if each one could kill, listening for tiny triggers that could cause my set face to blanch. My lover urges me out of the apartment into a cruel world, though I am terribly afraid of mouths capable of wielding language like a winter threat, my torso shrinking into itself. For too long, I have had to do these things, as when a great wind pushes a small boat out to sea before it is ready. I am the result of my convictions, some of them weak, some of them ashamed. It was hard to feel bodily, fighting this labyrinth of longing. Each time I take my therapist on merry-go-rounds, distract her from this deep-seated fear, this point of hurt. Uh, I'll conclude with two short poems, and this one is called Wish. I would like to live like the trees. My lover often says, look up, as she admires a canopy of green. Her tree-like behavior astounds me. If you looked within me now, you'd see that my languages are like roots gnarled in soil, one and indivisible except the world divides me endlessly. 
Some days I dare not look at the trees. They are such hopeful creatures. If the legislators of our world look to their trees for guidance, would they reconsider everything? Lately, I've been trying to write a poem that might birth a tree. A genuine acceptance of the self continues to elude me. Thank you so much for listening. It's been wonderful being here with you all. Um, thank you, Jane. Thank you, Ranjit, for your lovely comments. Uh, I'll conclude with this final poem. What my mother, a poet, might say. Be a river, she might say. Be the water that flows over and under and along, so you will never hurt from sharp things. Be the eyes that glow, be the body whose scent and sound attract all the colors of the night. Be the rainbow that leaps into that cleansed dome of sky after storms erupt from the breasts of millions. Be the tree that praises, even when the cacophony of tractors drown out its hymns. Be the roots that seep through stone. Be the echo of your blood, song of your bones. Thank you so much. Mary, Mary Jean, that was fantastic. That was um, uh, very moving, I must say. Um, I, I was just thinking, you know, you, you're so re revealing your heart to us in, in such an honest way that it's uh, it, it's it's very impressive. And um, your reading voice, so it, it's it's it must redouble the impact of your poetry. Uh, you're such a brilliant reader as well, and I'm sure the poems are fantastic on the page. But surely the reading of them is is, is really um, giving us. You know, it's fantastic. So um, thank you for that. Um, I'm sure the so people tuning in will enjoy it. And they, I'm sure they enjoyed all three. They were fantastic. And we're going to have a, a few questions and answers now, hopefully. Um, so I, just a couple of questions here. Um, and I'll just tr throw, uh, throw the first one out. And maybe, Jane, you can start and round it then. And Mary Jean, you can answer them in turn. Um, the qu one question that occurred to me was... Um, uh, I, I was reading some of her poetry and I was listening to your poetry and um, you're all from very different places and very different cultures and all that, but uh, all of your poetry is very accessible. It's um, it's not cryptic. That's as, that's as I, I, I feel on you. You know, it's it's, it's quite easy to, to get into. Um, but uh, right from, from my own experience of writing, I'm just wondering, do you have to, when you write a poem, do you have to to comb, comb a poem for a run through a poem to try and take out maybe the cultural or the regional references or maybe if you're overly, overly reflective, maybe there's information in there that only you know. Um, so in, in, in when you're writing a poem or have a poem written, do you find that you have to go back and go through the poem in, in, in great intricacy to, to remove those references or Maybe it just comes very naturally to, to make very accessible poetry. I was just wondering. Well, if, if I'll answer there, Colm, um, you see, I think the culture references, the things that are specific to your place are part of what enrich a poem, you know, and, and if you use dialect or if you use expressions or if you use words, you know, so, so it wouldn't be that that I'd be wary of, but I would be wary of any, I, I mean, I suppose I see a poem as a communication with, with someone else. First of all, it's a communication with yourself, but then it is a communication with another. So I would work, I would be looking for how, for some kind of clarity within it. Um, but but I, I love the specificities of place or language that can come through and that can be celebrated and that can be captured in a poem. I think it's a really important part of poetry that it does that. Um, you know, it can it can hold things that would otherwise get lost in the kind of you know in our in our time at the moment, which is all about uh, uh, you know making everything the same in a way, and it's the difference that celebrated it in poetry that I I really love. So, I don't know what my colleagues would say. 
Ranches. Uh, thanks for the question, Callum. And uh, I have to say that uh, I don't really try very hard to edit out any very specific references because uh, you have to be true to your situation or your predicament. And mine is a multilingual context. I mean, I write in English for historic reasons, but I am a multilingual person. And uh, it, by the way, it just occurred to me that we all have a certain post-colonial sort of uh, history in common. So coming as we do from these three societies, we know that we have all historically been uh, confluential societies. Many different and dissimilar energies have come together. So I don't start with some notion of a singularity, a cultural singularity. And I tend to, you know, as linguists put it, I tend to code switch when I move from one language to another or one culture to another. And I think that that's how poetry gets made for me, through acts of collage and bricolage, uh, which can take very interesting, intriguing forms just in terms of someone exploring language. I mean, I might reach out to how people are speaking around me. I might reach out to elements of other languages. Uh, I might reach out to music or bring in a Hindi or an Urdu phrase. But equally, I might want to go right down and dive down to the old Norse and Anglo-Saxon roots of the English language. I think what we're able to do today in this post-historical moment is really to, to choose to do what we will with language. And I, I, I like to think of language really as a, a medium in the way a sculptor thinks of his or her work. You know, what do you do with stone? What do you do with wood? What do you do with pigment? That's how I approach language. I don't think of language as some uh, preordained thing that falls down from heaven. It's what we make of it. And it's how we recraft it. So I'm, I'm not anxious about people being brought up short by some cultural reference. After all, I, I love Seamus Heaney's work. There's a great deal in that work which is not immediately clear to me necessarily. Blue cards you spoke of, Jade, for instance. Uh, but part of what we do as readers is to leap across those chasms, right? We reach out. And I think that act of embracing the other is part of what we do as readers and writers. Very good. Mary Jean? I think you can hardly put it more eloquently than uh, Jane and Ranjit. But I would completely agree. I think, um, you know, similar to many of us uh, who are brought up in post-colonial societies, I, you know, spoke two languages at once. You know, I learned English as a second language. And so perhaps for that reason, I am very careful in my choice of language and my choice of words, because, you know, at one point in my life, a lot of these English words were unknown to me. I had to, you know, basically read English books with a dictionary in hand or with a thesaurus in hand. And with that in mind, you know, I have a few poems in my collection that have Chinese characters in them, and I leave the Chinese characters un untranslated, unglossed. And, and that part was also me thinking, you know, maybe I could offer that back to the uh, reader. And, you know, if someone wants to know what these Chinese characters mean, they, they can have tools online and, uh, you know, elsewhere. They can ask a friend who might know Chinese to translate it to them. But I, I wanted to have that language in there as a kind of equal partner um, to English, you know, to say that actually English is one of the many languages that exist in the world. And and I wanted to, as Ranjit say, be true to my multilingual self. So um, I do think that increasingly the wonderful thing about poetry and, and the way that we're publishing now and kind of allowing different voices to come through is the, to dispel this notion that there's a universal I, right? There's this uh, speaker that applies to everyone. Um, obviously, we know that's not true, that, you know, even a voice who is from uh, London and who is from a, a middle class, you know, literary background, that's just as specific as someone who is Chinese and like me and from Hong Kong, you know, I think every single voice is an identity and uh, we should all embrace, you know, who we are uh, on the page, so. Oh, has, uh, has the so. screen gone? I think we've lost column um, just uh, temporarily. Oh, no. <laughs> Yeah. Um, but perhaps we could just uh, pick up there. I know it's a bit strange, uh, me uh, speaking from um, the invisible world. Um, but <laughs> it would be it'd be wonderful if maybe um, uh, we could hear from either of you, from all of you, how um, how uh, or in what ways do you think uh, poetry can contribute to what the world needs generally? Uh, poetry, a very general question. In what way do you think poetry can 
Yeah. Um, maybe we can start with Jane. Well, uh, that's such a big question. <laughs> you know what? <laughs> let's let's, I think let's throw that question well, away no. because Cullum's back, and we'll let him take over again. Sorry, there, Mary, Mary Jean. I think I, I went out there briefly. Are we finished that's answering that? Fine. Yes. Sorry, yes, I fast. have. No, that's thanks for, for thanks for the feed for the, the answers there. That was very interesting. Um, just another kind of more straightforward question this time, I suppose. Um, what are you're, you're all three very successful poets? What are common, maybe common traps for aspiring poets? There's probably a lot of a lot of aspiring poets listening in uh, at the moment, watching us. Um, can you think of uh, common traps that people fall into when they're trying to? Start over with poets. Jane, again, we'll start with you. I, I know it's hard giving giving you you're, you're the fresh fresh. Uh, you get the questions fresh. Okay, well, look, Calm. I should be able to answer this very easily because it's not so long since I was starting out myself about fourteen years ago, and also I'm teaching a, a a poetry course at the moment, so I should be able to think. What are the traps? I suppose. I mean. Is it is part of it is is well one thing is people have to read, read, read and read. One trap is when people think, oh, if I read too much, I'll be influenced by other writers. That's what somebody said to me recently. And I'm thinking, no, 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 read plenty, read widely. And 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 out of that, you will find your own voice. Don't be afraid of listening to others, tuning into others, because it's like I'm thinking this evening, this for me, listening to Ranjit's work and listening to Mary Jean's work, oh, it's so nourishing for my work. It's like you have a well, you do have a well, but you have to keep filling it. And so, you know, that would be my biggest advice for, um, you know, starting poets. And then something about just finding your authentic voice. I know that's not easily done, but it's to try and let yourself be as authentic in this as possible. I know we're creating and it comes out of a authentic. It's authentic and it's imaginative. It's kind of combining those. So maybe that's what I could say for to get the ball rolling anyway. Thanks, Colin. Ranjit? For me to, I mean, I, 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 I couldn't hope to surpass the way, the beautiful way in which Jane just put it, uh, that great well of reading that, that that nourishes us. I would say to poets who are starting out again, exactly that. And this is a universal problem, evidently, that people feel that they might somehow be influenced by, by reading a great deal. Uh, it's simply untrue. The more you read, the more you test yourself out, your horizons expand, uh, you just equip yourself in a completely artisanal way. So I think that's important. I think far too many people across the arts, whether it's poetry or the visual arts or music or theater, we are still in the grip of this romantic idea of the artist is genius. I mean, however much we might want to wish that away, it's still there. And I think we really need to go back to the idea of the artist as the artisan, someone who works with their hands, who works with things, which is why, you know, I was just so... Uh, delighted to be reading with with Jane and with Mary Jean that this, the thingness of things it's really very strong there uh, and, and I think that's an important piece of uh, uh, dismantling of the ego that uh, young poets need to go through you need to see yourself as someone who is going to be apprenticed uh, it seems like a terribly traditional sort of thing to say but you know this has held us poets in great good stead for centuries and we don't have to throw that away. Let us be artisans first. The other little thing I'd say is that uh, it would really be marvelous if people could read in, in multiple languages. I mean, translation is an excellent thing and I'm a translator as well, so I wouldn't want to wish away translation. But I think uh, that if you push yourself into learning more languages than you have at your command or in your comfort zone, uh, you learn to think in different ways. The shape of your thought changes. Your affect and how you articulate it changes. Your sense of the world changes. You know, I think it's marvelous if we can all be, rather than tight, defensive individuals, it might help if some of us were to practice a little individuality. See, see what we are like when we are different people. 
when we're more kaleidoscopic within ourselves. I feel like I'm, I'm at a master class where I'm learning so much from you all, uh, Jane and Ranjit. So thank you for that. Um, I guess maybe one little thing that comes to mind is um, because I teach creative writing at university and sometimes I think people are quite afraid of being edited, especially um, aspiring poets or, you know, poets who are starting out because they feel like, you know, almost like there isn't that much on the page and, and you're telling me to take out the final line or to delete a stanza, it feels very vulnerable. And I completely see how that can be the case. But but I do think, you know, we should be more open going off of what Ranji was saying that because, you know, we are not geniuses, we're all here to kind of sculpt our work and to learn from one another. Um, people often shock to hear that, you know, my poems have been in some cases heavily edited by, by another person. They think, but surely this is your original idea. This is your baby, you know, it can't be tampered with. But I. I tell them no. Actually, by the time a poem um, or a collection goes to print, it's been uh, sort of touched by many hands, and it's been uh, changed and altered and shaped by many people that are unseen. So, um, I would urge people to be yeah more open to having a collaborative approach to poetry rather than feeling that it has to be just from your individual consciousness. Very, very, uh, very interesting. Thanks for that, Mary Jean. There's some really interesting points there. I'm trying to write them down as uh, as I'm I, uh, as I'm I'm hearing them, <laughs> but um, uh, just there's time for another question, and um, I'm going to be a bit selfish now. Going to ask a question as a poet myself. This is a I've talked to a lot of poets, and one thing I find this this is a kind of a funny question. It might sound a bit a uh, bit odd, but uh, one thing I find is that I talk to poets. I write poetry, and I tend to write a poem very quickly, the first draft. It could take you know a half hour um and then obviously you, you go back and you spend lots of time at it but i've talked to poets and some of them say they spend days over a line before you know or days over a, a verse and i was just wondering what's your experience how do you in terms of the amount of time you spend writing the actual first draft the first verse could you tell me how that how, how that works for you Well, well, for me, the, the first draft would be, you know, like yourself, probably would come quite fast. Like often you, you, when something is moved in me, you know, it, something is moving and I think, okay, okay, you know, just write that, write that. But then it could take so long and that first draft might be put aside and I mightn't come back to it for a year or I might work on it for, you know, so long and still put it away. You, you know, and never and not come back to it for years. But there's something about when you've really given it attention, I find it kind of lodges at the back of my mind someplace. And then I'll remember it again and I'll say, all right, maybe now I'm ready to work with it. So, you know, so, I mean, I agree with you, Colin, but the first, it, it's really rare for me that a poem uh, is, is ready to go uh, immediately I've written it. That's very rare. I could tell you which ones in the collections were because they're so kind of, and, there's, and they're kind of glorious to me, the ones that come like that. But th that's that's much rarer. And I would totally agree with what Mary Jean was saying about editing. You know, I have a you know, small group of poet friends who are fantastic at editing my work, and I hope I do the same for them. And I wouldn't be published if it weren't for my editing friends and the work that they the help that they give me you know so yeah so maybe trending <laughs> oh, well, my experience is like like jane's exactly uh there's uh, there's that moment when something moves you like you said jane there's a kind of powerful sense an electric sense of uh, either an image or like a donet you just get that line and then you put it down but then days, weeks, sometimes years can pass. Uh, so that's really my method. I, I embraced that very early on. So I just have a series of notebooks into which these fragments and notes, sometimes they're sort of uh, passages in prose, uh, which kind of hint at what I might want to be getting at. It's like a scaffolding in a way. But usually just uh, fragments, notations, uh, images, stray images, and then I either wait or sometimes I just just sit tight and uh, focus very hard on some of these, and uh, and then they come together, and then I follow where that energy leads. 
But for me, it's really a, it's a process of working with these fragments and notations. But I try and make time every every single day to, if nothing else, just open a notebook like this and. I have to figure out how the screen works. OK, there we are. <laughs> so uh, you know, it's like a mine. You go down into the mine and you work away at it. Or uh, uh, another way to put it is, you know, we work like musicians work. You, you, you sit down with your voice or your instrument, and you, you work away at it. And that's, my, that's, that's what works for me, really. Uh, yeah, I suppose I, I would agree. It's for sure. Um, you know, sometimes it's an image. I think the, the thing I've been finding more difficult, maybe because of the, the lockdown and, and the year that we've had, is that, you know, these images and lines used to come maybe, maybe more frequently. And then now I felt like it's more difficult to tap into those moments where I feel like moved or because things aren't happening or, you know, things are a lot more confined. Um, so I think I've, I've had to be more conscious about how to elicit that feeling of, of wanting to write, you know, or even feeling moved. And I think, you know, participating in these readings or even just listening to a poet's recording, um, you know, going online and, and tuning into old events or just reading someone's book aloud to myself, that's been a great way to get someone's voice into my head. And then that would then spark an image or a line because I've been finding it quite difficult to write actually. Um, and I think that's another thing that maybe isn't as acknowledged, especially amongst, you know, younger writers is this, the sense of there will be, you know, sort of days when you can't really write and, and what do you do then? Um, and I don't really like this idea of writer's block because it can feel a bit fatalistic, like mm -hmm. it's a, an immovable object or something. But I do think there are ways to cultivate that, that inspiration, especially during uh, times like these. Very, very good. That's very, very interesting. Um, I suppose, really, is there anything you'd like to, to add? Or is there anything else you'd like to say before I uh, fin finish it out? Well, one thing is, Con, thanks very much for the questions, because I, I found it very interesting hearing what each of us was saying there, you know, so that was that was lovely. So thank you for that. That's just something like that. Yeah. No thank you so much. That's it's been a real joy reading with both of you. Likewise, it's just been yeah, marvelous. Just very, 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 uh, yeah. It's been, uh, yeah, it's been lovely, really. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Um, just to, to finish out, so um, to everybody out there, you know, the, the Winter Warmer Festival is um, it's, it's ongoing uh, for the next uh, all day tomorrow. There's some uh, poetry films, uh, if you're tuning in tomorrow as well, they're fantastic. Um, sometimes they don't get as many people tuning in. Um, that, that's the, the, the Winter Warmer Poetry Film Festival. Um, so um, uh, there, there's a, this is all voluntary and all, the, all of the uh, re readings are, are, are free to anyone who wants to, to, um, to go online. So, you know, Ovale could, could do with some funding. So if you, if you do want to, um, to um, give a donation uh, above the, um, the stage, uh, above the stage there there's a there there's a, a little link to a, a donation jar a donation jug so you can then um, click in there if you want, want to make a donation but uh, thanks very much again to jane mary jean and ranjit and um hopefully I, i'll meet, meet you sometime in the future that'd be lovely um and uh, right. thanks for the fantastic readings thank, thank you. you so much thank you. Thank you so take much. good care everyone thank you so much great fun. Bye. Bye. Stay well. Bye. 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 Bye.